you very much from all coming from different perspectives, but being able to draw on the fact that we're all here at the Federation for Detached Youth Work Conference, and I really appreciate how much effort you put into to linking that up. Hopefully, lots of people have been taking notes, and I can tell people are nodding along and we're thinking of things. So I'm really hoping you've all got questions. Your questions don't have to apply to everyone on the panel. They can go to individual people, or if there was a theme that you felt you were feeling or you were proposing going through your head when you were there as well, you were listening as well, then please, you know, we're, we're having it, we want it to be a discussion, but we want to take advantage of the fact that we've got these three experts in their fields here to talk about their, their pieces of work and the things that they've done and what they've talked to you about already. Who wants to go first? Great. Great. Thank you. Oh, Mike. It's probably about to you, but if anyone's at the back, it might be good to be self mic so everyone can hear. I see some connections between these three presentations. I think many of us will do that. But they don't live happily together often. That's a reality. And um, I'm always fascinated by how we've been in the street. And uh, I'm not sure um, it makes for being a good detached youth worker if you're not kind of OK with the street and able to cope with its discomfort. Um, but also the other side of that coin is the intrigue and the uncertainty. My own academic research is about uncertainties mm -hmm. and the celebration of them. Um, so my question really is about how they fit together. I mean, Jeremy's well aware, I'm sure, that um, the onside regime has been subject to quite a lot of criticism and that geographically it locates and sucks in resources. This is what's claimed, this is what's claimed mm -hmm. from the satellite <coughs> areas from the estates and, uh, and indeed from all these other projects. So how do we kind of get a big uh, picture where it all fits together? And that word fit is a word that I used in my book now nearly 10 years ago that, you know, right back in 1981 when some of the Bibles of detaching work were written and said, these things are different, but they need to be connected. Not everybody's going to go to, you know, to the finest youth club on the planet. They're not going to go because it's complex. It's very, very complex. And you can do your outreach, but still some people won't go. That's why we do project work with young women or whatever, or with minority ethnic groups, you know, because perhaps some of them will move in those directions, but others will maintain a steadfast commitment to presence in the street. So it really doesn't work when we say that there's nothing going on there because there always is mm -hmm. something going on there and for detached youth workers we want to know what's going on there i'll be talking tomorrow about colleagues in northern spain who was part of their training and education are forced to sit on a wall for three hours to feel what it's like for the many of the young people and indeed adults that they work with because there is something going on there when we might not instinctively see those kinds of things but there's there's a political dimension, isn't there? The politics of public space. Mm. We've got Mate, she is a professional geographer, and I'm sure you can comment on these things. And we look at child-friendly cities around the, around the world, especially in Ghent. 90% of seven-year-olds go to school on a bicycle unaccompanied by children, mm. unaccompanied by parents. In Sweden, they've created exclusion zones around schools that you're not allowed to drive in. So there's a whole kind of politics here that, uh, that needs unpacking and uh, I look for some comments on how these things fit together rather than potentially in an age of austerity actually sucking resources from one area to another. Okay, um, I think I, I was really struck by the connections as well, actually, because um, I was sort of looking at these three presentations at the beginning and thinking um, maybe they're going to feel quite, you know, quite different. And so um, I was quite interested in trying to trace some connections that I saw as well, because I think Kev, right at the beginning, sort of had a slip of the tongue, and a slip of the tongue is often a useful thing, because he kind of said from participation to isolation. Um, and, then he, and then you said, no, isolation to participation, it doesn't work the other way around. Um, and I think, in a way, in that slip of the tongue, you've sort of hit the nail on the head, um, that when people are included, mm. when young people feel that they have a sense 
of ownership of the spaces and places in which they live, then they don't become isolated um, in the first place. Um, but that once young people do become isolated, um, that working it the other way around is, is, is much harder, actually. So, you know, actually going from isolation to participation is much tougher than, you know, creating the conditions in, it, in which it works the other way around. Um, but I was also kind of struck by a couple of things that, in a way, affording people the opportunity to play is quite important with all of these different age groups. Mm -hmm. That, funnily enough, as soon as you become a sort of marginalised young people, you are only entitled to engage in earnest projects around personal change. You know, you're not allowed to have fun anymore. Uh, and, you know, so, 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 you know, what's that about? You know, if we register that actually this is the most difficult journey to make. And I think that one of the young people, when I was working with a men's room, I mean, some of them said amazing things to me, but one of them said to me, this is the only place I come all week where I feel normal. Um, and, you know, that is something I think that's really worth fighting for. And I think the opportunity to have fun with other people is something that we probably all value. <clears throat> but actually also sometimes in creative work, what's going on is an opportunity to symbolise things that people haven't found a language for yet. And that is kind of hugely important in initiating projects around personal change. And I'm turning this into a second ten minutes, so I'm going to... But I just want to say one final thing, and that is that, funnily enough, even though a lot of these young men who access the men's room are hugely disconnected from people, in a sense, they're making a home out of home in the city centre. So, you know, they feel at home in those spaces and places, you know, and they're kind of making a home there, aside from the fact that they're kind of hugely disconnected, uh, you know, from from, from f social and familial networks of support might be, you know you know, one word for it, or one set of words for it. Um, yeah, no, I think that was, it's a really good point, and it is something that we've um, thought about quite a lot, is um, how does what we're doing, which is kind of social change at a grassroots level, how does that fit with um, service delivery? And particularly, I mean, we've been more connected with the playwork world than the youth work world. But, um, you know, I think... It's not an it's not an either or, and I know it's easy to say that. And particularly, you know, when um, funding cuts are happening, you know, sometimes decisions do have to be made about where resources go. But um, I, you know, I just think as long as there is a need for particularly targeted services, then you know that that need needs to be filled by the best projects, you know, the best practice that is out there, and, you know. But it shouldn't um, <clears throat> detract from trying to change things at the root. And that's, I guess, what we're trying to do and what, you know, I'm sure a lot of other projects are trying to do is tackle, is prevent isolation <laughs> before it happens, um, to build strong communities, to give children and young people a sense that they, you know, they do belong in their communities, that adults do care about their well-being, um, that there's a sense of shared responsibility amongst adults in the community to look out for, for children and young people. You know, I might sound really idealist, but I don't, I just don't believe in, in giving up on that. You know, I just, I think it's really, it would be very wrong and negligent of us as an adult society to say, OK, well, you know, those days are over, you know, they belong in that rose-tinted past. When we were kids, you know, that was great, but kids now, they haven't got that, so we just we need to compensate for that by providing them settings or provide. you know, I, I just, I, I don't accept that. And, um, you know, I think it's our job as adults, and actually there's a sort of urgency, I think, because our generation, I know we're sort of probably slightly different generations in this room, but um, my generation of adults is probably the last one that really does remember that kind of age of playing out, being in, you know, being outside in your community, being normal. So if we don't do something about it to, to kind of try and bring that back, then who's going to? You know, the next generation of parents don't have necessarily have that experience. So there's an urgency, and there's an urgency about kind of getting children involved in their 
communities when they're young, I think, and not leaving it until it's too late. Or, do you want to say anything on that? Or? <laughs> I think, uh, just to say, you've, you've highlighted uh, possibly the biggest challenge. It's, um, it's getting the different strands of youth work to work together. Um, and the more that happens, the better the offer for young people. We all know that. Uh, but in terms of, in times of, um, you know, we're going through the biggest set of cuts we've ever experienced, uh, the, the less likely it is to happen, sadly, because uh, people get nervous, people um, uh, get competitive for resources. And it's uh, not in the best interest of the young people that we're all uh, here to work with. You know, we have to get all the strong youth work working together. And as pointed out really well, it's the, it is the ultimate challenge. It seems part of the challenge also that when they look at what the men's room are doing, it, it looks very different. In, in effect, it looks like nothing is happening. When actually, when, when we look in some of the my place centres, it looks like an awful lot is happening. And we know from the select committee on youth work, where we were all lambasted by Graham Allen. Why can't you people demonstrate what you do? I mean, that still rings in my ears. When, and, you know, if we only ever articulate what we do by a list of activities, then these kinds of things, they're just going to disappear, tip off the end, aren't they? And we'll never have any value in those things. So we need a narrative, we need images that portray the other side of youth work beyond leisure and vision. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, the two more people have um, I've asked to ask questions, but I would like to say please open it out to, to anyone who's here and just to give me a little wave if you if you do want to ask a question. Okay. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you for those. I'm, I'm really, really pleased with those presentations. It's, uh, it's made it's given me a bit of a revelation about the theme of the conference, um, which is to do with who is isolated and who is isolating themselves. And um, it made me reflect on, uh, well, first of all, detached youth work and the people you contact and, and listen to your presentation earlier about the, the people that you work with. Um, the people who, who are on the street and who use the street tend to own the street, in my experience. They, they feel that it's theirs, whether you're a child. Uh, or, or a teenager out on the street, or uh, the other example I was thinking of was the homeless people that I used to work with in London. Um, if they're out there and using it, it's their space. And, and so, and, and also that raised um, a thought that I often have about centre-based youth work, which I don't think is always the case, but I think one of the things that can happen with centre-based youth work, youth work is it's viewed as a place for young people to go out of the way. Um, by adults, necessarily, not necessarily by young people. Uh, I think that's something that centre based people needs to be aware of to make sure it keeps reaching out. Um, but no, the question you raised for me was 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 about who's isolated, who's being isolated, and um, those presentations have sort of clarified for me that, that the people who are most isolated are the people who aren't going out onto the streets, so are shutting themselves away, and and being fearful of what's happening out there. Yeah. Um, and so it made me wonder about practice. And I mean, yours is a great example, um, where the I mean, there, are, there are obvious benefits for the young people, but there are there are possibly greater benefits um, for the community in that it's forcing people to come out and engage with the street as a public place and be less fearful, um, because that's where the damage is: the, the fear of, of uh, interaction with the public and with the the, the, the nasty teenagers and the. the you know, the imaginary paedophiles and whatever else, you know, it's, it's, it's that fear that's isolating the adults and the, mm. the people with the power, really. Um, and perhaps that's something that we should all, if, if we're working on the street, be attendant to a little bit more. Mm. Um, the young people that we're working with aren't necessarily the isolated ones, and, and perhaps we've got a bit of a duty to do something about that. Mm. What do you think? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a really good point about the people with the power, because I think it is adults generally that make the decision about whether, I was talking to some people earlier in the bar about, you know, the fact that some kids are forced out of the house to go and play on the street, mm -hmm. and other ones aren't allowed out. And, you know, there's a real, um, bo both those sets of, kids are disempowered um, in different ways and you know and you could have a whole debate about which is worse off 
um, and which is in more which is in more danger because there are you know there are massive risks of not going outside, being stuck inside all the time, not getting any physical activity, not developing those social skills, not learning to manage risk on your own and all that kind of stuff that we quite often ignore. But that's a whole other discussion as well. Um, what was the question again? It was about whether we should be, if we're people who work out in public space, we should be more attendant of the people who yeah. are fearful of coming into public space. Absolutely. Right? And so one other thing that I you know, didn't specifically mention, but has been really amazing actually about doing this playing out sessions on my, my own street. We've now been doing this kind of on and off regularly for about five years. Is there are neighbours who are like the classic kind of recluse. There's one woman in particular who's, you know, total cat lady. You never used to see her. Like I didn't even, wasn't even sure that anyone lived in her house. It looked completely derelict and stuff. But because we're out on the street regularly. She does come in and out. And then the last time I was out there, she came over with a bag full of biscuits and gave them to me. And, you know, she didn't re really want to hang around and chat, but she was like, can you give these to the kids? And, it, you know, I felt like that was a massive... Well, the cat biscuits, was that? No, they were actual proper <laughs> human <laughs> biscuits. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and so I think um, just being out in that space is very powerful. Yeah, thanks. Um, just a very quick statement. Uh, listening to everybody and, and the, the contributions here, it just confirms to me what I've always thought, that youth work is not so much a job, more a way of life. And uh, the question is about finance. Ask a that question and see if you can get people to look at it from a different angle. To what extent do we always need finances to do work, good youth work? <laughs> oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I would, you know, honestly, from my own point of view, I would say yes. You know, I, I think it's, um, I think what we, um, how we help young people to, you know, uh, enjoy those years between uh, ten and twenty, uh, it, it's, um, it's a complicated and um, it's a complicated process, and we've really got to put things in place. Uh, I, I believe, and and, uh, and that means um, first and foremost, it really struck me what you said about having somewhere safe to go. You know, that's where I hear. You know, it's not just from young women; it's from um, you know big strapping seventeen-year-old lads as well. They want somewhere where they can feel comfortable, where they can feel safe. Uh, and I think in you know in our world, in cities, you know, places like Bolton, that means building somewhere for me. You know, if it's going to be theirs, and I think you said something about ownership about that feeling um, um, that they've got their own place and where they can feel comfortable and welcome and um, um, and, um, and not judged um, but somewhere where they can go um, so you know for me that I just think that's a place I think place is really important environment's important and something that fits in with the century that we're in is important and you you start recognizing all those things and for me that means a place that it's just for people, and that means building it. Mm -hmm. And then, um, I like to see you know, a young person go into a room and they uh, pick up a guitar because it's there. And it's not a guitar with one string, it's not knackered. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a good guitar, and if they want to plug it into an amplifier, they can. And then, in an ideal world, after it's been sort of um, messing around with it for 10 minutes, somebody will come and sit next to him and say, do you want to learn a couple of chords? because you're paying someone who is a music uh, teacher, and that's what young people should be doing in the evening. So mm -hmm. for me, I understand what you're saying that, you know, and I have so much admiration for people that can do all that and help young people move forward with just their own personal resources when they're out on the street doing it. And like I say, it was beyond me, um, but for doing it with large numbers, doing it in a real professional, consistent, seven night a week, where it takes money, it takes big money as well. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a really, I think it's a really key question. I mean, I think if I think about an organisation like the men's room, um, I'm really fearful. It looks very, very vulnerable. Um, you know, because funding this sort of work, 
I said, I part, apologies for the expletives, but I made my own walking tour with Jenny, who I did it with when we were kind of revisiting sites, and I said, the problem with this work when you talk it to commissioners is that it looks so fucking flaky <laughs> that it's really hard to tell a convincing narrative about this sort of work because what commissioners want is A to B type interventions. Mm -hmm. Interventions in which you can demonstrate the number of hits you've had, the number of contacts you've had, the journey that you've taken people on. We've all got to be on a journey these days, haven't we? Um, you know, from you know, from ideally from A to B. So it becomes super, super tough to defend um, this sort of work. So I think for staff, this is hugely difficult um, because the work itself is filled with uncertainty. You know, you could have a great, I, there's a student at the men's room who's doing a PhD with me now who did this great intervention as part of his um, social work placement that he was really pleased with, that people were really praising him for, and 48 hours later, the young man he did the intervention with was dead. Um, and, you know, this is the kind of level of uncertainty that people are dealing with in this sort of work, and yet they're also dealing with the fact that they might not be able to pay their own mortgage in three months' time because the organisation might disappear. So I, you know, I think it's hugely, hugely important work, and I see the level of commitment that people have to it. Um, and there are these two different forms of uncertainty that they're, you know, perpetually having to hold together. Um, can I just really quickly um, respond to that as well? Um, so. I think um, basically what we need to do <laughs> in an age of austerity is look at what, what resource we've already got that's underused and what we're doing with playing out is kind of looking at the, the physical resource which is the street as a physical space that totally lends itself to all kinds of um, activity not just children's play but also the human resource, which is people living in communities willing to give their time and their energy to do things. So I think that's kind of the first thing to, to look at, and not just from a point of view of saving money, but because that's how we will really change the world and, and, and build stronger communities, is by starting there. But I think if we can do that and maximise that resource and stop wasting money on um, creating spaces that try and replace that and staffing spaces that try and replace that because there are people living in communities that are, are there anyway, you know, they can be those responsible adults looking out for younger people and don't need to be paid. Then we could put more resource into the very specific, really good projects, really targeted things, um, does that kind of make sense? Yeah. Thank you. So we've got four people lined up. One, two, three, and four. And then if we've got time, more after that. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, this is this is obviously really helpful, and I think for me, as as a kind of youth work practitioner, we kind of influence and affect the environments that, that we work or choose to work or create. Um, for me, whether that environment is a sense of identity is being in the opposite of that is isolation. And it's really important that we see all three aspects of the report. As, as a detached youth worker in North Edinburgh slash Scotland, the context that certainly I'm concerned about is that um, when young people get older and they have that dealing with their own isolation and identity on the streets, social policy drivers of, well, you have to play the other part, you have to be here. And if you don't really do that, when you're hanging about the streets in threes and fours, we're going to criminalise you under antisocial behaviour, yeah. stop and search. Mm -hmm. So they're damned if they do and they're damned if they don't. And that's a massive concern alongside kind of... We, we, we have to have a broad context of, of supply and demand and involving young people, and it's pretty clear that young people will be involved in a, a really, really important process here. And it's how we empower, continue to empower and enable teenage young people so that they don't end up going, well, actually, if you're going to leave me and label me as a criminal, I can be a criminal. I'll lodge you up. I can be a pain in your ass if you want. But I just want to have that sense of non-isolation and identity. And it's a big concern for us where it turns into a game between the polis. I mean, we've got helicopters in the sky, you know what I'm mm. Do you know what I mean? You can label me what you want, but it's, it's our place. 
Completely. And it's not that much different. The headset's not that much different. My concern is that as youth work practitioners, we are powerless in that process at times. Mm. Mm. Can I also I no, 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 no. Right. We'll go on to the next question, but thank you very much. Yeah. Just a line. <laughs> 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 there's, a place, there's a place for everyone's communication. Well, in this well, you just said kind of echoes some of the stuff I wanted to kind of ask. Well, of course, when we're looking at isolation, for me, um, working in London, some of the young people like to isolate themselves from the agencies who will support them because that's their own identity. Like doing lots of street work, um, we found, especially with the antisocial stuff around the criminalization of drug use or just bad behavior, which is threatening, some of the young people don't feel to engage with the services simply because this is their space and it's designed by themselves where when they engage with services or workers, they tend to think, well, how much shaping and how much development of that space is going to be their ownership. Mm -hmm. And again, you're working with agencies who they may feel, well, okay, if we're working with you as detached workers, are you working with the police? Are you putting us under that spotlight so we can then suddenly feel that we don't have that autonomy or that kind of ownership? So it's sometimes difficult to get the young people to work alongside you when they look, well, what other agencies are out there and who are you working with and how safe is their identity as opposed to the identity of what you want to develop them into. So it's sometimes one of the challenges we find. Can I say something to that? I think I, I mean I think it's a really important point. Um, and you know my experience is that these young men who, who access the men's room kind of take up a, a borderline or borderland position in relation to any organisation that works with them. And I think in the context of the men's room. That's where the kind of peer-to-peer -peer relationships um, are critical because actually it's normally peers that bring them into the men's room or bring them into contact with a men's room, you know, in the first place. Um, but that's also really complicated as well because those peers could be vital to their survival, you know, in street situations, but also might be people who bring them into contact with risks as well. So, you know, it kind of adds to a kind of heady mix in, you know, in, in, in defending this, you know, this sort of work. But I think without it, um, I think you're completely right that you, you wouldn't seek to engage some of these people um, in, in the first place. Um, because it's only by the credibility that they get as an organisation by virtue of, you know, association through other young people that, that will get people... You know, sometimes to you know make contact in the first place. Did anyone else want to comment maybe on partnerships or networks as well that you joined up with as well as a follow-on from that? Yeah, um, yeah. I was just going to say about the um, engaging young people point um, that, like, our project is very much peer-to-peer, -peer, but it's adult peer-to-peer -peer support, um, and we don't really kind of go out of our way to engage young people directly. I think um, our attitude is that adults have kind of um, taken away a lot of the freedom and the, and the sense of belonging that children ought to have, and it's our job to kind of look at um, the reasons for that and how to, how to address it and how to bring it back and how to sort of um, bring back that sense of kind of welcome to children and young people to be in the streets and to be in public space, but it's about creating, there's a sort of play work um, sort of mantra which is like create time, space and opportunity for children to play, but I think it probably applies equally to older young people as well, they just, they need that space, they need to feel welcome, um, so it's kind of, it's not so much about directly engaging them, it's about enabling them to feel welcome, I think. Uh, yeah, I don't really have anything no. to say about the services. No, I, I just want to bring it down a little bit in terms of um, my, my world, my reality, my experience. There was a time in the past when the taxi workers uh, 
there was an elitist thing about detached workers, you know, uh, there was a debate, you know, what's best, club-based work or um, or, or street detached youth work, and, and I, I kind of think, you know, and Jeremy's alluded to it, it's having more of a, a comprehensive approach. Yeah. There will be young people who want to go to Lads and Lasses Club in Bolton, and I've seen it, one of the most amazing facilities I've seen. I've also um, you know, the young people who don't want to go there, and I think the um, that's where the role of deep, deep, uh, deep, deep touch youth work comes in. But I just think it's getting at a place where we can complement each other's work, all the different strands here. And a lot of detached workers in this room, Jeremy, will be miffed about the My Place initiative. The millions and millions that went into that, and we know Graham's alluded to some of the, uh, the findings of, uh, of some of those My Places. So we're miffed. All the all vast majority of money has gone into one particular approach and we're struggling with, with peanuts, just reaching out to some of the most vulnerable young people in society. Mm. But it's, I still think that we've got to establish a place where we complement and make sure all the work is adequately funded. Mm. Mm. Um, I'll ask one question at the end. I would like Kev to kind of join in on this, if Kev wants to answer a bit of this question as well. Um, so I'm sure you have a view on it. <laughs> what was, one of the things I was interested in, Jeremy, when you were talking about the centre that you'd opened, which I think is really great in Bolton in particular, and all the young people that travel quite far to get to that centre. But my question is really, and my kind of statement is from a detached youth worker point of view, and from a youth worker that does work within a centre as well, um, how do we reach the harder to reach young people? Because there's a balance between detached youth work and a balance between kids that will access a centre. What I've found from doing detached youth work is that you've got young people that are not confident enough to go inside a centre because it gets quite territorial. So you're finding kids that are hanging about the streets that may have mental health issues, they may need to advice on sexual health, they may have dry, drug and alcohol um, issues. So they wouldn't go into a centre, so the only way we can reach them is to go out and do street-based work. So my question is, how can we continue youth work that reaches the harder to reach young people that doesn't require a massive amount of funding? If anyone wants to answer that question. I, I don't know. It's, um, I, I'm not sure we should be even um, asking that question. I think we should be um, you know, speaking up for the need for the work and, and, and saying that it needs funding and, and finding the funds and convincing people that, that it's imperative. Um, you know, these, are our, um, these are our young people and we, we, they, they haven't got the money in the pocket. You know, to go and buy that cinema ticket, which is why all those adult facilities flourished in the 90s and noughties, because it was just a com commercial proposition uh, for our young people, particularly um, our young people that are within the, some of the poorest areas of the country, uh, don't have that money to make a, a commercial place for young people to go worthwhile. It's not viable, but we've got to provide them. And so um, I, I think there's lots of people in government would love to uh, see us all scratching ahead and trying to answer that question, how do we deliver great youth work on no money. Um, but I think most of the money appears, from what I've seen, most of the money goes into centre-based youth work, and I think more money needs to go into street-based youth work, or there needs to be a balance. You made a good point before. I think, you know, th there is a lot of young people that are yeah. slipping through the net, and that subsequently we've ended up with issues. I mean, I work for a housing association. If young people are on the streets, they could cause antisocial behaviour. I think young people should be allowed to go on the streets. I don't think they're necessarily causing antisocial mm. behaviour if they're hanging about. But that's, that could be something that could happen if they're just hanging about because other people's got a perception. If they're standing outside their door and they're being noisy, that that's ASB. Do you know what I mean? So I'd like to see more. I know we can't solve the, solve the problem in one conference, but I'd like to see more funding go into detached youth work yeah. because I think it's, I actually think it is the most effective method of engagement. And, you know, that's just my, I've not sure. got as much experience as you, but that's just what I'm finding no, no, through the work that um, I'm doing. Uh, I, the, the, the issue is that the cake needs to be bigger, you know, and, it, and, um, and I think the worst thing is where the practitioners are falling out about who, um, who gets the big slice of the cake. It's the cake that's yeah. not big enough. That's the big issue. And you could have, um, um, you know, all the great youth zones in the world, but there will still be some young people that vote with their feet and decide they don't want to go there. Yeah. And that those young people will need support, whatever the type of project whether it's the men's room or whether it's some other detached project, they will still need those projects. So it's not about where should the money go, one or the other. You know, we've just got to keep fighting that we need the money to do both because these 
um, we have to support young people to give them the best possible offer they can, the best opportunities, so they can thrive and develop and become confident and be safe and, um, uh, and enjoy a really um, uh, happy adolescence. I mean, you know, from my point of view, uh, you know, I think that's I, actually an aside. Don, thanks for introducing me to this kind of internal competition in youth work because uh, I've been hanging out. I've been hanging out with social workers for the last fifteen years, and when you tell a social worker that you're a youth and community worker, there's sort of so finally, you know, honed sort of look of pity that they managed to uh, <laughs> uh, direct towards you. Um, so I'm glad there's some sort of internal, uh, you know, competition. But, you know, completely agree that actually, you know, look, these cuts are philosophically driven, aren't they? You know, we know that. Um, and so we shouldn't give up, you know, fighting the, the argument, you know, that this sort of work needs funding and it needs proper funding. You know, to, to do it well. I mean, the perverse thing is that the kind of it, it seems that we've all, in a way, internalised the neoliberal project, haven't we? You know, as we, we're you know asking how can we do this good work on the cheap now? You know, and actually these young people, you know, the young lads at the men's room, the the, the fact that they're expected to be independent providers for themselves, it's it's not something that's lost on them. You know, they need this provision. And they hate the fact that they need it. You know, they're the lads who are 26 are saying, if I'm still here when I'm 30, you can shoot me. Because they feel, you know, stigmatised by their own need. You know, and that, you know, so that is the society, you know, that we're creating. And I think, we, you know, we have to continue to, to, to make, to try and m create better arguments um, and narratives about, you know, the need for this sort of work. Yeah, so, I mean, like I said at the beginning, I don't know much about youth work, um, but it seems to me, what I'm hearing, that you're kind of dealing with the sharp end of the results of what my project's trying to prevent and tackle at the early stages. Um, and, and those problems, you know, th those results do exist out there, and they, d and they do need to be um, dealt with. My um, experience with the play work world as an analogy because that's kind of a service that's now been provided to provide children with play opportunities that have kind of been lost as part of normal life. Um, my experience a bit with that is that there's a slight, there can be a slight resistance to the idea that, um, that play could be just embedded in normal life, um, that parents and people in the communities have something to offer. It's become very, very professionalised. There's, um, you know, there's qualifications around play work and, um, and there's a little bit of a sense of, you know, not anyone can do this. You know, you have to have your level three, whatever, play work and VQ or whatever it is in order to help children to play. So I think it might just be worth thinking about whether, um, kind of when it comes to young people, whether there are kind of more resources out there in the community that could be being drawn on to sort of just support what you're doing, not to replace it, but, you know, because obviously expertise is, is massively important, but to kind of add value to it, especially when there's a lack of funding. Uh, this might be a slightly rose-tinted view, but I, I mean, I felt that your project is so important because it's not just young people who are disconnected from the communities in which they live, it's everybody, isn't mm. it? You know, in a sense, you know, when you used to play out, I mean, all my important uncles and aunties are no re relations mm. to me. Yeah. You know, there are people who lived, you know, uh, who, who had kids who lived around me. So, you know, when kids get out in the street to play, everybody gets out in the street. So the old guy who comes out with his cup of tea mm. is coming out probably to feel part of a community. Oh, definitely, yeah. You know, rather than being stuck indoors, mm -hmm. you know, on his iPad, probably. Um, <laughs> if, if my mother-in-law is staying with me this week, and uh, she seems to have spent more time on the iPad than anyone, actually. But, uh, there, you know, there you go. So, so, you know, perhaps that does, taking an interest in other people's lives, does begin to get that on people's personal agenda. And perhaps that is, you know, an important part of instituting a sense in which we all need to be a bit more interconnected, yeah. which is obviously what we're trying to, you know, achieve for yeah. young people like this. And, sorry, and just the other thing to say is if, you know, if adults have known children growing up in their community from a young age, got to know them through 
being out and about, then are they going to be as fearful of those young people, you know, when those mm. young mm. people become right. teenagers, right. And, you know, maybe, know maybe there'll be a bit less of that sense of separation and fear. Mm. 